So it's been 10 years since your last book. Yes. Since then, you've done a web series for Deleted. I did. Short, um, short films. You've wrote scripts for TV and film. Yes. Uh, Many collab- of them not made. <laughs> collaborated with artist Alex Israel in a series of paintings. For Gagosian Gallery about, a year, uh, about two years ago here. Uh, one of those exhibitions was here in London. And you host a fantastic Brightest and Alice podcast. Uh, thank you. It's surprising to be here in the UK and in Ireland and to know so many people listen to it or subscribe to Patreon. I was really surprised by that. Yeah, there's some listeners in the audience, right? Uh, no. Yes. <laughs> there's some hands up. So what made you want to explore these different mediums and what brought <clears throat> you back to writing and what? <clears throat> Um, I don't know. I mean, it just seemed natural, like, to do a web series or to do a podcast or to start making short digital films <clears throat> just seemed like um, where everyone was at at the moment. And I don't, um, I, I never was thinking that it was strange that I would be doing it. It just seemed that this was what people were doing and why shouldn't I do it? And I have to admit, for the last 10 years after my last novel, which was in 2010, I really was kind of done with the form. I'd written six novels, one collection of short stories, and I have spent the last decade trying to get movies made, trying to get TV series made. I did uh, direct a web series, which is in some kind of legal limbo, so it's we're trying to figure out a way to get it to a wider audience. There are some degraded uh, episodes of it on YouTube. It's called The Deleted. And I actually think the whole thing might be on YouTube, episodes one through, I think, ten I did, or maybe. And you can find those, but they're, they're not good quality. Um, and then suddenly my agent was asking me if I wanted to put my podcast monologues, my movie reviews, my criticisms, my cultural criticism into a book. And at first I didn't, and then a friend who I dedicated the book to, Matthew Spector, um, suggested that I uh, give it a shot. And so that really is what White is. It's a collection of mostly my podcast commentary and um, sometimes rants. Um, my favorite thing of the podcast and your book is your film thoughts. You've really emerged as a interesting and fearless film thinker in recent years. You spoke about American Gigolo, 2001, um, the TV show Atlanta, Boogie Nights, and you don't hold back. You really don't mind trashing a film if you think it's rubbish, and that's really rare and refreshing in these days, and it's a theme in your book, so I was wondering, what is it about having a negative opinion or an unpopular opinion these days are so troubling? I don't know. I really don't. I try not to review movies that I want to trash. I don't, I I don't really trash movies. I, I, I hopefully take a deep dive into a movie. Baby Driver? I never reviewed Baby Driver. Okay. Uh, No, I, what I said about, I, I mentioned Baby Driver in one of, uh, in, um, one of the podcasts because I was out with a producer in LA who, um, and I, and apropos of nothing, I told her that I thought uh, Baby Driver was the cinematic equivalent of fake news. <laughs> and um, she had a fit that I used the term fake news, and it got into this whole thing about using the term fake news, and she had a fit about it. And, and that's really the only time I've mentioned Baby Driver. I actually have been emailing back and forth with Edgar Wright. Um, about being in his Sparks documentary, if you know the band Sparks. He's making a documentary about the band Sparks, and we've been going back and forth. And he has forgiven me for saying uh, something negative about uh, Scott Pilgrim. So we, we, you can be friends and have yes. disagreements about your own work. Certainly, I've lived with people who do not like my books. So I think it's normal to have different opinions and... You know, uh, for example, you bring up Baby Driver, Edgar Wright knows these things that I said about a couple of his films, and he's fine with it, and as he should be, and that's how life should be. You know, we have different opinions. But I don't, I really, I rarely trash a movie on my podcast, or if I have negative things to say about it, I try to go into a deep dive rather than tweet about it and talk about why the movie didn't work for me or did work for me. Um, yeah, we were talking about this with my friend earlier. Why have you, you used to be so amazing on Twitter. 
Maybe I Soka think, 2000. Yeah, I don't know. Albums. But it was like not worth the hassle. I mean, you get to a point where it's just not worth. And yet still, I don't tweet, and yet I still get Twitter trolled uh, occasionally. And it's been happening a lot since White has been published. Um, especially by millennials, who I found out are easily triggered. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know how easily triggered millennials were, but they are. Or the mainstream media. I didn't know that either. Very easily triggered. So um, I don't, I mean, I used to be this sort of uh, Twitter person who, uh, I don't know, would offer my opinions about that. And I actually talk about it in white. There's a chapter called Tweeting and how the various times I've gotten into trouble and for having certain opinions and stating them in certain ways that uh, people didn't like. And I talk about what it's like to have a mob after you. And I've been talking about that on, uh, on this tour uh, in terms of like what it's like to have, um, to be Twitter trolled. Not pleasant, but you have to stay true to yourself. And yeah, on this topic of tweeting, you wrote the best tweet of all time. Do you, um, do you remember when the Lars von Trier press conference for Melancholia? Do you guys know this one? This is legendary. Does this ring a bell? It rings a bell. I it's mean, so fucking I, good. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of seizing up a little bit, but uh, yeah. Should we skip over it? I can, no, I can, you can say it. OK, yeah. It was when, <laughs> this is the best tweet of all time, so I have to share this with you. Um, it was when Lars von Trier did the Melancholia press conference. Very good movie, by the way. Good movie. And he, he's, he, I think he made a bad joke about Nazism, yeah. and he tried to get out of it, and he just dug himself in more. And, and next to him at that press conference was... Kirsten Dunst. Kirsten Dunst, that's yes. right. And she was sitting next to him. And if you look at photographs of that press conference, it is um, noticeable that something's gone, gone awry. And you tweeted... Kirsten Dunst looked way more sad at the Oscar party five years ago when I told her I ran out of coke than at the <laughs> Lars von Trier press conference. I was being That's a bit amazing. cheeky then, Seriously. and, um, and I'm, I don't know what to say. It was, I was at an Oscar party. It was late at night, and there, there were people around, and I don't know. Maybe that was TMI. Maybe that was too much information, but I, that, is, that is the kind of tweets that I used to do that actually made me popular on Twitter, but actually caused such a shitstorm of like negativity that at a certain point, and that was, I kept tweeting after that, I mean, for quite, quite a, uh, yeah. a while after, and then at a certain point, Twitter just didn't become fun in that way, where you could tweet something like that, and then you wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't get canceled, and you wouldn't lose projects, and everyone would go nuts. There was a time when people kind of didn't see the entire humanity of Brett in that tweet. I think that time is gone, and I think people do look at particular tweets and say, this defines the individual, let's cancel them, let's get rid of them. And that's the problem with Twitter, and that's why I really don't go on it too much anymore, except to uh, publicize a podcast. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think you're a contrarian when it comes to film, and you're not caught in controversy. I think you had enough of that with American Psycho when you were getting death threats and hate mail, yeah. and your publisher dropped the novel. But is there a part, there must be a anarchic side of you that likes causing some hell. I think there's an anarchic side to everybody in this audience. Yeah. I think everybody has that side to them that wants to stand out and be an individual and state their opinion and say, I think you're wrong. I think it's this way. And I do think that we're in a moment where people are too afraid to do that. And I don't like that moment. I don't like the way that people are too afraid to voice opinions or voice differing opinions and uh, you know, get this mob outrage over a differing opinion, and maybe even you know, more disastrously lose work or lose money from it. I, I don't like that moment that we're in right now. But I also feel that um, um, that's what it means to be alive, is to have opinions. What is a man without his opinions? And, if and the problem <coughs> now is if it doesn't right. follow this sort of group think and you're not this kind of pod person agreeing with this, agreeing with that, then you are, you, you are threatened with banishment. And that's, 
That's scary. But I'm also at a point in my life where I don't care. Cancel me, cancel me, cancel me. If you don't like something I said, if you don't like, if you think an opinion of mine is so outrageous that it uh, deserves condemnation, you know, then so be it. I mean, I'm, I'm too old to really care about that much anymore. Silence from the audience. See, I don't think you... Dead silence. Did you ever care? I mean... No, I don't think I did. I mean, I remember from a very early age uh, not caring about what other people necessarily thought of me. And I remember very clearly when Lesson Zero was about to be published, a classmate of mine who, who became a quite accomplished journalist and writer... Uh, when we were 20, he had read the manuscript once it was published that week. We were both at Bennington College, and he had, he said, what, you got a book published? Can I read it? And so I showed it to him, and he came back like hours later and said, okay, um, how in the hell can you publish this novel? How can you let your parents read this novel? How can you be the son that lets your mother or father read this novel? And I realized, God, I don't really care. I mean, I didn't write it for my mom or dad, and that is like part of the problem. If you're writing novels for your mom and dad, you are <laughs> fucked. <laughs> That's great writing advice. Um, and another, another great thing that I love you for. Um, in 1985, you wrote in the book that Vanity Fair assigned you to interview Judd Nelson, and you pulled a hoax, is that right? I did. We pulled a hoax on Vanity Fair in 1985 when I was 21. Uh, the editor, Tina Brown, uh, I w Lessons Here really hadn't even been, uh, become like a bestseller then, and she wanted me to write for the magazine, and I went up to New York and from my college, or I went down to New York, I don't I forget, and she wanted me to profile Judd Nelson, who she was very annoyed by. She found Judd Nelson to be very annoying, and at that time he was the annoying character in The Breakfast Club and in... Um, St. Elmo's Fire, and so she, I, I felt that she wanted me to do a hit piece. And it was a lot of money. People forget that in those days, magazines paid a lot of money to writers to write these profiles, which doesn't really exist anymore. And so I was 21, and I was um, intimidated by her, and I decided to take the assignment. And I met with Judd, and I told him, I think they want to do a hit piece on you, and they want me to write it. And so Judd came up with this idea about... Let's sell them. It was it was the L.A. issue of that of that fall, and he said, well, "Why don't we just sell them about the absolute coolest places in L.A.?" And I said, "Okay." And I told Danny Fair instead of Judd Nelson, it's just it's going to be me and Judd going to the super cool youth places in L.A. And we went to like every tacky sandwich shop and every <laughs> crappy motel lobby and the Museum of Neon Art and. <laughs> this tarot reader in Glendale and said, these are the coolest places. And we were photographed in front of them and I wrote about them and, you know, um, and some of them did become cool, actually, after, <laughs> after the article was published. But of course, I was never asked to write anything for Vanity Fair ever again. So that was part of the takeaway. I don't know, I, I felt like <clears throat> a journalist asked me recently, how dare you do that? What about your journalistic <laughs> oath? How could you actually lie to a magazine and give them that piece? And I thought, oh my God, this is a Judd Nelson profile. I mean, you're really, it's not like I'm writing about the AIDS epidemic or <laughs> Reagan or whatever. It's a, it's a dumb movie star profile. And I thought it was much better than a movie star profile, actually. You can Google it online. The photos are amazing. Who is it? Brendan, Brandon? Uh, Brandon Bransford or something? Yeah, he did, yeah the, the, they it was are. It's like a really, really prestige photo shoot. Yes, and we looked so and young. Gorky's, Gorky's so young. Russian Deli. Gorky's Russian Deli, we said, was like the hippest <laughs> restaurant. Hipper than Spago. Hipper than the Beverly Hills Hotel. And um, yeah, that was, oh, the 80s. The 80s. And why you hint at a new novel? I was wondering, can you talk about that? Is that still happening? I'm, I'm still hinting at it. Uh, I want to write this new novel, but I don't want to uh, become tortured by it as I have in the past, where I spent eight, seven, six years writing a book. Um, I want to do something kind of fun, fast, um, something you can also listen to uh, more, maybe more than you would be reading it. Uh, I don't know. It's still in the air, and I'm still thinking about it, but White definitely ignited this uh, notion of going back to, to fiction and to writing uh, another novel. So, final question, why Phantom of the Paradise? Why are we here tonight for Phantom of the Paradise? Well, you asked me to do this a year ago. Two, two years ago, you asked me to do this. No, this year. 
it was in 2017 oh, at, the, at the Wilton. Oh no, I different guess person. <laughs> no, no. We, we met in uh, we met in January and February of 2017 in at the Wilton Firehouse. No, or Children, Children Firehouse. Yeah, Children Firehouse. We did, and we hit up Gagosian's budget and had a extravagant lunch, which I enjoyed. All right, I saw this movie at 10. <laughs> Do you remember we said it was all on Larry's money? So let's just I, do, rinse I, it. I, I remember yeah. there was a lot of food. In, uh, there was a lot of food that we ate, um, but um, and it was all paid for. So yes, it was all, it was a, I don't know. I, it's it'll be interesting to see how people uh, feel about this movie. It is definitely of its era. It is definitely from 1974. Uh, some of the humor might be dated. Some of the PC elements might be dated, especially in the character of Beef, who's the lead singer of the Undead, who's a bit gay, and there is a little, and also there is uh, Paul Williams who plays Swan, the impresario of the Paradise, has an opening line <laughs> where we first see him that is decidedly on PC, and people might sh be shocked about that. I'm gay, I don't mind it at all. Um, and um, it's a comedy, uh, and it's a parody, uh, and it is also spectacularly well made. Whatever the elements are of this movie that might seem dated to you, this was Brian De Palma's first kind of, I think, real visual statement, even more so than Sisters or Hi Mom or Greetings or the, the earlier films that he made. This was the first time that he was really working with a studio. Still wasn't a high budget, and people like Jack Fisk, who was the amazing production designer for this, really worked at their highest level of craft to make this movie work. And I think, as Pauline Kael said, every image is kind of overflowing with detail and with, I think, great beauty. You might be groaning at some of the lines, you might be thinking, rolling your eyes at some of the situations, but overall, I think this is a piece of pure visual poetry, pure aesthetics, that's why I love it. And, um, and I... I would say go with it in the spirit that it's been offered. It also, I do believe, has a great score. I love Paul Williams did all ten songs, and they're they're all really for a musical pretty good, pretty solid. Even though a lot of a couple of them are parodies, especially the opening number with the juicy fruits, and a great sequence, a split spring sequence that was uh, the second time De Palma did that. He did it in Sisters with uh, the Beach Bums and a great song called Upholstery. So it is a musical and it's got its clumsy, awkward moments, but pay attention to, I think, the visual poetry of this movie and I think you might like it. I think Perfect. you might like it. You might not. You might think, what in the hell are you? Do you come to London to like show this movie to us? <laughs> I, why are you at the BFI showing us Phantom of the Paradise? But um, take it in the spirit in which it's offered. And I think once you're into it, you'll begin to see what I mean. But also notice um, uh, really the beginning, the flowering of De Palma's signature visual style. 